So this final panel, which I'm particularly excited about and which is getting my mouth watering as we get close to happy hour, um, is about how the good food movement is drinking well. And I'm excited, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, really pleased that we have in our midst, uh, we've had uh, please join us. Um, we've had many experts here today, but we have leading this panel Alan Katz, who is truly one of the most knowledgeable uh, folks in the nation when it comes to distilled spirits and cocktails. Uh, Alan is the Director of Mixology and Spirits Education for Southern Wine and Spirits in New York. Uh, he's also the co-founder of the New York Distilling Company in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, where he produces Perry's Tot, Navy Strength Gin and Dorothy Parker Gin, uh, and a forthcoming rye whiskey, which I think is already out. The rye whiskey is not out yet. Not out yet. Um, Alan also serves on the board of directors of the New Orleans Culinary and Cultural Preservation Society, uh, the host of the Tales of the Cocktail. He's on the advisory board of the Manhattan Cocktail Classic, uh, the advisory board of, of liquor.com, and he's Chairman Emeritus of the Board of Directors for Slow Food USA. And I'm particularly excited to have Alan and his panelists tell us why we should be thinking of alcohol as an agricultural product and why all of our interests in beer and wine and spirits is reinforcing um, all the same trends that we see in the, 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 uh, uh, the local food movement. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. I'll, I'll give a brief introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with good friends and colleagues. Uh, uh, I'll introduce them momentarily. But as a, a brief introduction uh, and just some perspective, uh, fun for fodder and for conversation, even for argument in edible and gastronomic circles, I would say that uh, the modern food culture, the modern gastronomic culture in America let's say it goes back 40 years with a renewed intense interest in food and where our food comes from, 40 years approximately, let's say the Chez Panisse ballpark. And then somewhere along the line followed suit uh, a more intense interest in wine and viticulture and wine regions from different parts of the world and the explosion, which still takes place today, you may have read recently, the percentage of wine that Americans drink that comes from California in particular. Uh, and then followed suit a real interesting dynamic of uh, a, a real upshot of the so-called craft brewing movement. It took a little dip with the economy uh, through the course of the 80s and now it's skyrocketing again and then I would be honest, last but not least, even though that's the business that we're in, has been a renewed interest, uh, and I'll give you a time perspective on that in a moment, in cocktails, and now cocktails related to their attributes from the distilled spirits that they're in fact made from. So the timestamp, when I say renewed interest, is approximately 85 years. So cocktail culture was once eminent in this country, as you, I'm certain, know, uh, but it really took place before prohibition. And we all like to laugh at prohibition, those silly people that uh, none of us knew personally. What the hell were they thinking? You know, that's fun, you laugh, it's a good laugh. Uh, uh, but there were some serious issues at the time, not just here, but certainly in the UK and other parts of Europe, in the overconsumption of alcohol, not just distilled spirits, but wine and beer as well. Distilled spirits happen to have more alcohol in them. That's all in my opinion. Uh, but really post-prohibition, I would say that it took about 85 years to reclaim our taste buds. And the reason I reference that 40 year arc is that it took going through food culture and wine culture. And I'm in my early 40s and had the opportunity in my 20s when the dollar was strong and there was no euro to go to Europe for the first time and experience other cultures gastronomy. And for me, it was my slow food experience, frankly, that offered me the chance to ponder what might be American gastronomy, authentic American gastronomy. And I still, to this day, argue that there are only two authentic American gastronomies. One is barbecue of the American South, comes originally from this country, and the other is cocktail culture. And to get to the point of our conversation today um, uh, with uh, my friends here is that within the set of cocktail culture has become this new, uh, not just, it's not an environmental stance, but environmental relationship between boutique or small scale or craft, whichever word 
you may prefer to use at this given time distilleries and farmers themselves. And so we're in unique businesses. As Brian introduced, I have a, a, a relatively new, a uh, little over two and a half year old distillery, the New York Distilling Company in Brooklyn. Uh, and we are all under a unique license called the Farm Distillers License, which we'll get into momentarily, which allows us certain privileges in the state of New York specifically, provided that we derive a certain percentage of our raw materials from agricultural products grown within the state. I believe it's 61? 70 percent. 70%. I don't, you know, most of the people making products are probably using more than that. We make rye whiskey, as Brian referenced, it's about 92 percent uh, derived, uh, products derived from New York State agriculture. But within that context, there's a burgeoning relationship uh, between distilleries, breweries, wineries obviously, breweries as well, but in our case, distilling operations uh, and the farmers that grow raw materials that are of great interest to us. And that's what we'd like to share with you today is some drink for thought, if you will, in the context of how our work uh, and our burgeoning businesses of, of different ages, frankly, you'll get three really different perspectives here, uh, how that's not only influenced by, but is also perhaps just at a precipice of influencing uh, some additional agricultural trends, in our case, uh, in New York State. So I'll, I'll introduce uh, our, ourselves here. Uh, to my far left, uh, to your far right, is uh, Nicole Austin, uh, the distiller and blender for Kings County Distillery, also in Brooklyn, New York, in the Navy Yard, uh, and also a principal with Oakview Consulting. And uh, if you just share your distilling story with us particularly. My distilling story? Sure. Sure. The uh, history of your operation. So Kings County Distillery um, was the first distillery to be licensed in New York City since Prohibition. Uh, we were, took advantage of the farm distilling license, which was officially created in 2009. Um, so we got our license in April of 2010. And we produce a corn whiskey and a bourbon whiskey um, using 100%, it's all from uh, New York State corn. It's grown up in the Finger Lakes area. And we have, um, how I got into the business was, I think the story that kind of, I'm sure everyone comes up and tells the exact same story, which was the moment that they realized, you know, they asked questions about the thing that they love um, and where it came from, you know, I, in my case, whiskey it became immediately clear that that was something that I could do as well, you know, and you don't, you don't think about it previous to asking those questions, like how is this made and how does it come to me? Um, and you have that moment of realization that I, I, I know how to distill things, like I, I can make bourbon. And, um, and that's, that's what inspired us to get into it. I wanted to bring, bring something back to New York State um, and make a high quality product, you know, like every other you know, pickles and everything else, um, you know, we were faced with a landscape that had just a few large scale producers. Um, and we thought there was a lot of opportunity there. And we were faced, we were the first, but there were like, there are now 20 in, in New York City. So there were a number of them that came right on our heels. And thank you. And uh, to my left here is Jason Grisanti, uh, the owner, founder, distiller, cider master of uh, Warwick Valley Winery Distillery and Black Dirt Distilling up in the Black Dirt region, about an hour and a half uh, north of the city. If you tell us about your history and operation. Thanks, Alan. <clears throat> so, like the name implies, we started as a winery, and our winery opened in 1994 with the Farm Winery Act. Uh, again, analogous to the Farm Distillery Act, farm wineries also have to use a percentage from New York State. In our case, we decided to use 100%. Um, <coughs> in addition, when we started our winery, we also started making hard cider. And <coughs> the, uh, with our Doc's Draft hard apple cider. Um, and then in 2001, um, we decided we were going to start making fruit spirits. So we applied for and received uh, the fruit brandy license from the state of New York. And we were one of the first distilleries at, at all um, to do, become a uh, micro distillery in the state of New York, um, making fruit spirits. And we did that for, I guess, for four or five years with uh, some, some success, but really, uh, we, I think we were a little ahead of the curve at that point. 
And in 2007, we decided to become a farm distillery. Um, and at that point, we could make more products than just brandies, and we started making gins and whiskey. And um, it was a really interesting time. Right about that time, people started uh, becoming interested in craft distilled products, and the market has blown up. And we are in the mix of a boutique distilled spirit uh, revolution, and it's great to be part of it. Thank you. So I can, we can see you relatively well from here. Just by a show of hands, how many people are not from New York? Great. Oh, I can see it's great. So most of you are not from New York. So this is a very personal thing for us, but I think we would share this. One of the most unique aspects of having operations, and there's some things that overlap in all the things that we do, but having that operation in New York State specifically is the advent of this farm distiller's license. And I don't know if you're aware if states that you may be from have that, but if there's information, at least from my perspective, that we could share with you today is that, again, personally speaking, that this would likely revolutionize distilling in the states where you reside and do business and share relationships with producers and farmers uh, and co-producers, et cetera. Uh, and these two probably have a better sense of the history of the farm distiller's license. If you want to chime in on that, because it's really the advantages afforded to us as small businesses, both from a financial standpoint, but also to, if you will, in lay terms, get a leg up from a retail standpoint that fall under the dynamics of, of what the state has afforded us in this opportunity. And Nicole, if you want to start on yeah. your historic perspective of I the, the farm distillers license. Uh, so um, also, Alan didn't mention it, but I'm also um, the president of the New York State yes. Distillers Guild. So I work very closely uh, with Albany on legislative changes. Um, more recently, uh, Ralph Lorenzo, really from Tuttletown, was, was, um, had the, had, was doing this before me, but I work with him closely. And New York is unique. There's only a few other states that have pursued this avenue of attaching license privileges to the idea of using agricultural product from your state. And I think it was incredibly valuable to us, and, and doing that really helped launch New York into the top tier of states that are seeing this revitalization. Um, Oregon probably being the other one, we're sort of neck and neck in terms of number of licenses. Um, New York State currently has 82 distilled spirits licenses that are issued, and last I checked, Oregon had 83. So trying to get two more people um, to sign up for licenses. It's and not a competition. Yes, it is. <laughs> No, I'm pretty sure it is, um, and I'm gonna win. Okay, <laughs> but it, that it, it's unique, and I think that we've been successful because um, you know we're facing a, a regulatory system that was mostly written in the 1930s, immediately post prohibition, um, and the attitude at that time was that distillers are gangsters. Um, and they're not the kind of people that you want in your state. So even as alcohol sales trickled back into the country post-prohibition, the idea of having distillers in your state uh, was not appealing. And so in trying to change that, and, and then it just stayed that way because no one asked about it. You know, So politicians don't just change things just because. And so when we came later to the 2000s, when people started asking about changing it, our biggest ally turned out to be the Farm Bureau. Um, and that was the way, it was their power um, and their influence and their legislative savvy that really led to the creation of these licenses. And the argument that we made, which I, I think was so powerful and that they helped us craft, was really about the value add um, of specialty grains to New York State farmers and specialty fruits. So, you know, New York is a, is a huge agricultural state. Um, you know, we don't often get lumped in, but we are a large agricultural producer. But competing on the commodity market is challenging for, you know, the, for New York farmers. Um, so part of the argument was, you know, if you're producing corn or growing apples or whatever, um, that turning the agricultural product into a distilled spirit just adds a lot of value. You know, like the relative value of the bushels of corn as compared to the value of the bourbon that I make from them is much higher. 
Um, so I can afford to pay a premium to my farmers to get a higher quality corn. Um, there's taxes that go back to New York State that they can use um, to help support the agricultural community. So all of those things um, create a really powerful argument. I think that was the big impetus towards changing it, and that's why we've seen so much success. And the advantages, though, to us as distilling operations are, are what specifically from both of your perspectives? Financial? Um, I think that the, the opportunities afforded to us by being in New York and having a great agricultural sort of network to work with is al allows us to make um, a variety of products. You know, we're not in some place where, where there's a lot of sort of monoculture. Um, we have a lot of different uh, fruits and vegetables. Vegetables aren't really used in distilling, but fruits and... Uh, Just wait. I'm sure some people grains, do it. Um, available to us to make all sorts of interesting products. And the way the license is structured, the, you, you don't have, you can be licensed in New York, I'd say of those 82, um, about a third of them hold just a commercial distilling license and not specifically a farm distilling license. But And with a commercial distilling license, you can make anything. You can make anything regardless of where it comes, no. where you buy the grain. But the, f I suspect that we would have seen growth, but the farm distilling license, the way they structured it, there's a lot of privileges that are attached. So the ability to do retail sales at your facility, um, that's one of probably the farmers biggest markets. ones. Farmers markets, yeah, the ability to sell your product at farmers markets. So the idea was sort of, if you build it, they will come. If you create these opportunities, people will be motivated to take advantage of them. And I think we've seen that play out. So even in 2001, when we re received our uh, distilled spirits license, we had a fruit brandy license. Um, I applied for and received a grant from the state of New York. It was a value added grant. So even before they had come up with this idea to have a farm distillery license, they recognized that there were, you know, opportunities and we received $50,000 in 2001 to start our distillery from uh, the New York State Department of Ag and Market. So how, how did you do it? They had a they had a value added producer grant. So you were talking about value added products. So we used we we I wrote a grant and yeah, got it. It was great. <laughs> There's a few gaps that, that sort of remain. This is still very new and evolving. Uh, you know, the marketing on this end that continues from the state right now is a big light that shines on people like us, on our operations, on our businesses. And on our products, and you know, there's, uh, you know, from the uh, the New York State standpoint, it's fun, from an agricultural standpoint as well, to read often and certainly recently about the glory shown on yogurt from New York State, uh, and that this is like the international product from New York. It's now been deemed by the uh, State Assembly as the official snack food of the state of New York just this past week. And in a similar fashion, I would say, you know, we, we get the glory right now, and I'm not sure what the, the need or desire, frankly, is from the farming communities, and specifically the farmers that people like us work with, but right now they don't get a lot of attention in this game, if you will. Uh, uh, you know, it's the end product, it's the end result, and um, my apologies, and certainly Rick Peterson's apologies. He's a farmer that we both work with, Jason and I, uh, directly as a source for grains uh, from up near Seneca Lake, but he's working on a farm today. Um, but it's an interesting perspective from his vantage point, having spoken to him, he's not really interested in the attention, but the viability of his business, which is a thriving business, he's not in any struggle here. He's got a long-standing family farming, organic farming operation uh, up in the Finger Lakes. Um, but there is value added from both a business standpoint and a cultural standpoint uh, to his uh, uh, evolution, if you will, of his business and how he might pass it on to his kids as well. And their interest in if you will, cocktail culture and how it's influencing what ingredients might be popular or what grains have been fallow for generations that might make a comeback or other fruits or ingredients, uh, you know, amongst them, say, hops that once upon a time thrived in New York State and have in for several generations. It might be interesting to see if that makes a comeback here because of not only brewing but distilling interests as well. Um, Nicole, all of your products fall under the farm distiller's license? Yeah, um, I 
we don't hold the commercial license okay. as well. Some people hold both licenses, but we've um, we're really just focusing on whiskey, and so we hold only the farm distilling license right now. Um, but that's been a challenge. There are some products that I would like to make and that I've made sort of experiments with um, that the New York ag community just hasn't quite caught up to giving us the the supplies that we need, um, specifically malted barley. Yeah. But what's great about that um, is that since that demand is there, you know, since I, since we all need it, um, pe farm, people are working to see what they can do to provide it to us. So I think it will come. It's just going to be a little bit slow. Um, like I have a great single malt that I would really, I'd really like to bring, um, bring out, but we can't quite yet. Jason and I both make products, different products that fall outside of the rules and regulations of the farm distilling license. We both make gin. That's the only one that I have that's that is okay. not farm distilled. Okay, so that's an easy distilled. one. And just so we're all on the same page, and perhaps it's obvious, but the reason that it, it doesn't uh, fall in that realm is that the majority, if not all of the botanicals that we use to make gin uh, come from the four corners of the earth. So uh, uh, that's the primary reason it doesn't. But we're still granted that license because as long as I believe you make one product that's, no, it goes, no. Kind of, uh, <laughs> what do you have to do? Every, Up. that that um, privilege of, if you only have a farm distilling license, you're only allowed to make New York City. But if you so have it's both. Not, it's not an aggregate. If you have both, you can do you can do whatever you want. You That's what make, I'm saying. Yeah. But to, to have that farm distiller's license, you need to make one product yes. that falls within the tenants yeah. of this this agreement uh, with the state. Yeah, we, we make pear brandy, apple brandy. Um, the only one that we don't make that or that doesn't fall within our D license or farm, winery, farm distillery license is the gin. Um, <clears throat> but I was under the impression that if you had all the other ones, you could have one that... There's been a lot of confusion about, because it's regulatory, you know, people thought that, like on aggregate, that the percentage was applied on aggregate of what you produce, mm. but it's actually every, it's every each bottle. Individual product, yeah, I agree. So the privileges are attached to each bottle. Well, it's confusing. Yeah. Um, and when we are definitely faced with that structure, we're, as, as a state that's kind of pioneering, regulating things in this particular manner, um, there's been so, a lot of challenges. So if we could talk, the, the three of us, from a specific standpoint and get a little bit more into the agricultural realm and the, the, the agricultural relationships that we have and how they've helped our businesses grow, Nicole's for almost five years, Kings County? Yeah, four years. Four yeah. years, Jason's for 20, generation. 20. 20 years. Uh, he's got kids working for him now. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> our business is not quite two and a half years old. But even in that time frame, and maybe, Jason, you're a good person to start with this, if you could quantify in some degree dollars, gross weight of agricultural product. Per year, even a per day. Per, per, per year is fine. But a snapshot from, say, when you started 20 years ago to 10 years ago, the cocktail culture, even in New York City, for those of you who are not from here, is less than a decade old. It's really still a brand new function of a, a interchange between culture and gastronomy. And now instead of just having a drink at the bar, you can have a whole meal at the bar in a lot of not just restaurants, but cocktail places. Uh, and it's been exported, you know, not just to San Francisco and Chicago and London, but to St. Louis and Iowa City and Portland, Oregon. And it's really crisscrossed the country and been influenced by local trends as well. But so uh, give me, give so, us some time so stamps let, let, on let's that. Let's talk about apples. Uh, when we first started making apple brandy, you know, that was 12, 13 years ago, uh, we were probably making, using rather, um, of roughly four to 5,000 pounds of apples per year, maybe 10,000 pounds of pears per year. And this year, I estimated that we bought four, and we also grow, but we're a larger produ uh, purchaser now than we are producer of apples and pears. This year, we purchased 450,000 pounds of apples and um, about 100 and 50,000 pounds of pears. And that's just for our distilled spirits. We also make a hard cider. And that's just for distilled spirits. That's just for the distilled spirits. Um, our hard cider, in total, we probably 
use mm. the equivalent of about 100 acres of apples in, in total alcoholic production um, at this point from, you know, maybe we had a quarter acre 20 years ago of apple production. We need about 100 acres of apples if you were to take them all um, for our production. So it's pretty. That's interesting. And were there, is it straight shot up the trend chart or was no, there no. any up there, and down? There was a That's very really what I'm interested <coughs> there in. There was a very short, the, the beginning days were very difficult. Um, there, people were not interested in drinking products from New York. There was a time period where you would go to liquor stores and they said, New York, we can, we're not going to buy anything from New York. The only thing New York can make is Boone's Farm apple wine or Bully Hill or uh, any of these other products that were just, you know, sort of undrinkable. Um, and there was a, an idea that New York couldn't make excellent products. Um, and that, that idea took time and it has evolved. And now you go into retailers and So when did bars. the jump take place for you to get to? I think that the, the jump know. started around 2007, 2008 with okay. the farm distillery license and people becoming more aware of the products that uh, we make uh, as collectively. I mean, gi give a context. Jason has a significant operation and piece of property up in Warwick and you get approximately how many visitors a year? About 70 thousand visitors a year come uh, to visit really us. Really well established uh, entity uh, up in Warwick that, that has got a following now and a recognition. And we used to not have anyone come. Yeah. You know, there were days where I would sit there all day and not see a single customer. And, you know, I'd sit there with my dog and, or, and, <laughs> and distill and put a sign on the front door and say, come around back. And now there's, you know, people are interested in coming out and seeing where food is made and where spirits are made and, you know, going for drives in the country and getting out. And it's really an amazing time and an awesome industry to be in. <laughs> and Nicole, from your standpoint over that four-year arc, any sense of the, the growth uh, either by dollars or volume or some other quantification of the grains that you use? And also, if you will, uh, um, either the ease or challenge of how you found, I guess, the corn, the rye, and other ingredients? So uh, when we started, uh, since we were the first, we had big plans but couldn't get big money. Um, so we scaled way back, and we started with five five-gallon stills. Um, we did that for the first year. So that's tiny. Just give you, that's like laughably tiny when I went to conferences. Um, and we went through on those... Uh, about two bushels a week, maybe, which is like fits like 100 pounds of corn. Um, and now we're going through about two tons a week. Um, so we went through through two expansions, um, and we're we just can't keep up. Um, and we're limited purely by the amount of capital that we were able to get um, in order to invest in in bigger equipment. But we could easily. Oh, if I'm al I'm already planning round two or round four rather. So just to interrupt you briefly, so you're yeah. only limited by the capacity of money. of my of the financial tanks, capacity. Frankly, so is there any? We'll get back. I want to yeah. hear the rest of that story. But if you could also include, is there also any limitation in terms of sourcing grains? Since I'm focusing on corn, in, this was sort of a feedback loop of what was happening in the ag community and what we wanted to make. We ended up focusing on corn whiskey because corn is, was probably the most reliably available in quality in state at the time that we were doing recipe development. Um, rye, there's a, there's a strong interest in it, um, but we, had, we were challenged to get a hold of consistent rye. Um, I, uh, in my experience, all the distillers are super friendly all year, except in August during the rye harvest, where we become a little cutthroat. Um, but that's I, some people are, have success with it, and we don't. As soon as we are able to get a hold of it on a regular basis, we'll make a rye whiskey and a single malt as well once we're able to get a hold of more malted barley. Um, so it's kind of a feedback loop of what was available and what we liked that was available. And the corn that we're getting from New York State makes a huge difference in terms of the quality of the product. You know, when we switched just from buying like commodity corn for development. And then when we found the farmer that we were gonna work with and started using their corn, it completely changed the spirit. And I would say absolutely contributed to our success, um, you know, in terms of reviews and, and medals and awards and quality and taste. Starting with quality raw ingredients made all that difference. So, uh, go ahead if you have something to Well, I was actually gonna talk about corn briefly because we also have started making whiskey. And I, 
from a we're purchasing corn and we're actually also growing corn and I'm uh, the difficulty I would say that we're having is I'm trying to find different types of uh, seed for different types of corn to plant um, and sometimes that's very difficult you know finding non GMO corn seed uh, is very difficult or finding finding heirloom corn seed to plant is very difficult and very expensive and the yields are really poor <laughs> so so you know you're it's uh, this coupled uh, equation where you have poor seed poor seed availability and poor yield um, I think that that would be a great thing for uh, farmers to sort of get behind and try to figure out ways to improve our uh, seed availability. I've been working on the uh, Grain Growers Initiative, which was an uh, initiative that's being led by the state um, to support you know, all these farm licenses that we've communicated back to Albany that we need them to invest in supply, especially of malting barley, um, and that's a lot of the brewers as well that really need that. So sitting in those meetings, um, they are investing in with Cornell. A lot of people are doing research, trying to figure out what malting barley varietals are appropriate, um, doing studies, and then we keep being stymied by exactly what you're describing, which is they do these trials. Um, they say, oh, okay, I think you know this varietal and this varietal might work really well this year. Let's try those. Um, but they're not available at the seed stores. And the cost of flying sure. seed <laughs> in um, is so com it's so prohibitive that you do all this research and it ends up, well, we're just going to plant what the feed store has because that's what, that's what we're doing. So I, I think that'll be a big challenge. If we can address that, I think that would fundamentally change the variety of ag products. And, and these are long-term projects. You've got to take into consideration the youngest of the major... Kentucky Bourbon Distilleries was founded. 60 makers was 80s? No, no, no long 60s, before. 60s, the, yeah, in 60s. the 60s. And of the real giants, it really goes back to, you know, some of them have been around since before Prohibition, but really they've had a long-term arc to develop these uh, relationships uh, and considerations and volume issues and warehousing issues, all the things that play into not just turning the still on and making a product. Uh, for one other perspective, at our distillery in Brooklyn, we don't make bourbon, we make rye whiskey. And as Nicole was referencing, rye is a little bit tougher to come by. Uh, and from our perspective, we made the choice to, really even before we had a distilling operation uh, to go and visit in person, that we would start investigating and ultimately contracting with Rick, uh, specifically Rick Peterson, uh, to grow grains for us. Uh, and he said, you know, and he, he was one of the few people that took it seriously, in fact. Uh, but in, this is really our third distilling season, if you will, of rye, even though our business or operational business isn't quite three years old, uh, that we've gone from about 30,000 pounds of rye the first year to 40,000 pounds or 50,000 pounds of rye the second year to about 300,000 pounds of rye uh, this distilling season, if you will, this year of distilling. Uh, and so, you know, the arc is out there, but there's not really an end in sight to see what the complete limitations are short of we know that there'll be shortages of rye. Specifically, corn is a little bit easier. Uh, the malted barley or the barley, in fact, is of interest to me as well, but I think it's going to take an even longer time yeah. to discern what the quality of the barley is. And so, you know, at the end of the day, as new businesses, particularly in Nicole's, in our case, uh, specifically, at the end of the day, you better damn well have a good product or otherwise people get fatigued by it. And there are new distilleries opening, whether it's in New York or some other part of the country. And I think certainly you'll see this trend uh, boom, equally so in Western Europe in the next 10 years, and it's just as easy to go on to the next product as well. So it's a nice, entertaining, if not somewhat complicated jumble to say, all right, what are your priorities? Is it to only source locally, or if I can get a better grain somewhere else, whether it's Pennsylvania or Canada or some other uh, uh, elemental region that can provide for me something that's interesting, perhaps something that's unique in the standpoint of corn. Uh, and all of those things, I think, increasingly will come into play in the decisions that businesses like ours have to make, and provided that at the end of the day, we have to maintain 71% to 
fall into to this farm distilling category. Um, in the few minutes we have left, and then if there are any questions, we'll be happy to take them. Just want to say, what are there any you know, challenges or drawbacks that you've had, maybe Jason, you in particular, uh, whether it's translating exactly what you do from a government interaction standpoint or production standpoint, any drawbacks that you've had in the farm distilling license or products you've made that fall under this license? Drawbacks <coughs> of for the farm distilling license. Or challenges that you've overcome challenges well I, I, I again the grain uh, challenge the for us actually one a product that we started making was um, creme de cassis uh, and when we started making that that was 2005 2006 and uh, a neighbor had gotten in touch with us and they had grown some uh, currants and had uh, you know, was wondering if we could figure out something to do with them. And so I said, sure, bring them over and I'll try to come up with something. And I came up with a product that I thought was pretty great. And I couldn't find enough currants to continue making it. Um, the product that the, the problem has since rectified because there are now more current growers. But at that time there were not. And, you know, we, we had to discontinue it for a short period of time. Anything from either your perspective that regulations have been slow to adapt to the evolution of all of us being humbly relatively young in this business, young as people and young uh, distillers, maybe not chasing you so much from the distilling standpoint, but still relatively youthful. Uh, but the evolution, relatively, the evolution of the regulations to the demands or desires of, of distillers themselves. I think the biggest challenge that we're facing is there's still this sort of neo-prohibitionism that's still kind of really present amongst a lot of politicians in particular. Um, you know, we have a blueprint. We know how to create a successful agricultural-based industry. Um, you know, the wine groups certainly have created a, laid a path for us. We know what is needed. Um, you know, we need trails, we need promotion, we need the ability to sell at retail, to sell glasses so that you can touch your customer, um, you know, and, and explain to them what you're doing and show them what you're doing and that they can buy it from you. We know what is needed. Um, and there is a hesitancy always to grant those privileges to distillers. There's still this sort of mental distinction from, you know, uh, between beer and wine and spirits, like that spirits are the hard liquor and those are the soft alcohols. Um, and we're, I think we're facing that challenge. I mean, certainly in New York, we're lucky. Um, Governor Cuomo and the SLA and Taste New York, he's been incredibly supportive of the distilled spirits industry, but he can't control everything. Um, and we're, I'm certainly seeing that, you know, that's probably our biggest challenge that this hesitancy, you know, people have no problem with the idea of a vineyard selling you a glass of wine, but when you propose the idea of me as a distiller selling someone a glass of bourbon, there's this like, <gasps> you know, I don't know, this pushback. And, and we're facing that, and that's going to be a bit of a, that's probably our biggest regulatory challenge, I think. I think the state's been really wonderful, actually. The they state, have been. The, the state, you know, I have no complaints with the state government. They can be really more supportive in all of our businesses. Um, the federal government, on the other hand, is a whole different ball of wax. And, um, you know, for a good example would be the federal excise tax, uh, wineries, breweries, they have small producer tax credits. Um, if you are a small producer of wine, you pay 17 cents a gallon of wine to the federal government. If you are a small producer of spirits, you pay $13.50 per gallon to the federal government. Um, and if you're a large producer of spirits you pay thirteen dollars and fifty cents per gallon so there's no you know i mean i get it, it should be uh equitable, equitable yeah. across we just went and did the lobbying day about that so i was just down you know like lobbying in dc about exactly we have a bill to ask for fet reduction and i think the most frustrating thing about that is fet is the federal, FET is the federal excise, excise tax. tax yes of course sorry so we were, we have a bill to, to fix this parity issue um and it's just so deeply frustrating when you walk down there and you get told, oh yeah, we think that's a great idea. We absolutely support that. Um, but our government isn't really doing anything. 
so it's not going to move. You know, like we, they're, you're up against, oh, well, we've been told that the Finance Committee is literally not allowed to introduce any new bills at all. They're just not working. They just, no, just, we agree with you. Seems like a great idea, but just, no, not going to happen. Um, so that's really frustrating. The state, I mean, I didn't mean to misrepresent. New York State is an incredible. They are so helpful. Governor Cuomo is really pushing to support this. He sees agritourism. He understands the benefits. He wants to help distilled spirits. It's just slow. It's legislative. It's you heard slow. it here first. Reelect Governor Cuomo. We love but, Governor uh, Cuomo. More of that. On please. that note, I know uh, we're short on time, and we have a cocktail party to go to. I don't know if there are any questions. We're happy to address them. Uh, yes, anyone, anyone. If not, yes. Uh, I've tried all three of your guys' stuff and regularly you. get uh, hey, hey. some of it, and it's really good for people out of town. You should get some. Uh, so I have some friends uh, who have a hard time with uh, new distilleries uh, because they say, uh, like, why would I pay for something that's not aged 12, 15 year years or whatever? Uh, what do you say to that person, and are you moving, because I imagine especially, not maybe not as much for Warwick, but in New York you don't have a lot of space to age, uh, what are you trying to, I guess? Well, sure, I mean, I can answer from a couple perspectives. The salesperson in me thinks and says something similar but slightly different. In the most polite, direct way, it's wonderful that you have an opinion. Uh, and if you don't like uh, unaged spirits or younger aged spirits, I'm glad that there is a host of not good, but fantastic, if you're talking about American whiskeys, American whiskeys that you can choose from. And uh, we don't make unaged spirits, but if we do, we say, well, we're going to work on unaged spirits. I hope you'll come and taste those too. It's really a long haul when you're talking about aged spirits. The business person in me says, thank goodness that there is an immense market here where we live, and there's such a, a variety of interests that there's a time and place for just about anything. And in my limited time as a salesperson, oh, I've got to go on and try and sell to the next person. But it's wonderful. You know, we, I make three different styles of gin, and I'm a devoted enthusiast of other brands of gin, too. It's very subjective, and I respect people's taste opinion. What I want to pound my fist on a bar and exclaim is that my products are well made, and here's why. And if you don't like them for a variety of reasons, I can accept that. In terms of aging, we are. We're limited in space, and so frankly, we, our, our business has partnered with Jason uh, to outfit more space because he's on considerable more agricultural land north of the city that, that we can share to some degree or compensate his business to a, to a degree so that we have more room to age, to grow and be more than just the pet brand of, of metropolitan New York area? For us, um, so I, my corn whiskey is unaged and my bourbon whiskey is aged, and so I've faced a lot of people saying things like that to me. Um, and we're aging in a small barrel. We're using five-gallon casks as opposed to 53-gallon, which is like that typical Kentucky size. Um, and not to, I don't want to spend too much time going into the details, but it, it matures more quickly because there's more oak presence. Um, and so people that are married to this specific, there's a lot of consumers that are like, I, why would I not pay money for something that's, you know, why would I pay for something that's not at least 12 years old? Um, and I think that that's a challenging oversimplification. Um, you know, for me, as just from a perspective of what we wanted to execute, I duplicating what's done already in Kentucky just had no point. There was no reason to do it um, because I if I manage to make something that looks and tastes and smells and is made in a similar way, like exactly the way Buffalo Trace, you know, makes their George C. Stag, what like, and I'm going to ask someone to pay twenty dollars more a bottle for it. You know, what have I really achieved, like, in chasing, duplicating their voice and their product? To me, we wanted to bring something different to the market. I mean, that was the point of us starting the business was to increase the variety of what's available in American spirits. So we're not chasing um, you know, what Kentucky is doing. They already do it incredibly well, and they make beautiful products in the way that they make them. So we wanted to make it in a different way. Um, and not everybody likes that. And if, you don't, if you're not interested in trying something different, you know, stick with your Bud Light of bourbon and, and enjoy. Thank you. Fine by me. <laughs> Any other questions? Go ahead. Um, Alan, you mentioned earlier um, 
Chez Panisse as sort of, you know, 40 years ago, yep. kind of the catalyst that launched this know your farmer, know your food kind of movement that we're still, um, still sort of hoping to perpetuate. Was there something similar 10-ish years ago in the cocktail culture that sort of a, a person or yeah. a particular drink or a spirit or a restaurant or a yeah. bar? To my experience and involvement, there's not quite a, a, a parallel, but that it was an evolution. And as a per, I'm 42, and I've, Chez Panisse has only been in my consciousness, say, for 15 to 17 years, 15 years, let's say. But to follow that arc and in personal research and experience, to watch that from food to wine to beer very specifically, and then all of a sudden, as Americans, to look inward and say, do we have gastronomic culture here? What is our history that we share with the rest of the world? And then referencing the barbecue as one. And the idea of the cocktail is germanely American. There are some other parts of the world that have had influences, but it is an American thing to, and it sounds simple, but it really isn't to make a well-made cocktail. You have to follow a recipe like you were baking a cake or, or whatever it is you prefer. Uh, there's a skill set to it. And the idea of the American cocktail and the American bartender far past uh, the movie's cocktail in Roadhouse uh, is really, uh, I take it very seriously, of great cultural significance. And, and for a generation that I'm probably on the cusp of being at the older side of now, these are now professionals that spend equal time in the lab or in the library as they do working at a bar, whether it's a standalone bar or a restaurant bar. There are probably a couple of titanic figures. One is Dale DeGroff, who worked at the Rainbow Room. But the customer base wasn't interested in what the American gastronomy of cocktails or who Jerry Thomas was, this grand figure uh, of cocktail lore, uh, who pub wrote and published the first cocktail book in 1863 the Bon Vivant's companion, but all of a sudden, this underpinning of, hey, we're Americans and we have something to celebrate, I think there's something great to that, and it allows us to share in the international gastronomic experience. And that's why you can go to London and Paris and Barcelona and Auckland uh, and Moscow and Buenos Aires and have American influences on cocktail cultures in all of those cities now too. So uh, I believe that concludes our session. The one thing I'd say to those from out of town, welcome to New York. And if you're looking for a great place to get a cocktail while you're in town, ask us out in the lobby and we'll give you some suggestions in the neighborhood or wherever it is you're staying. <coughs> Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks.